afternoon, everybody, and um, a really big welcome to you, uh, Professor James Chapman, on this Monday afternoon. I understand you're beaming in from a very, very windy Manawatu, is that right? Yes, that's right, Carla. It is very windy down here. Um, so we won't be like the news presenters that we saw on TV last night, who I don't know if you saw them, who were struggling to stand up um, under those um, pretty... Um, uh, wicked conditions. So thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. I think it's um, a really great opportunity for us to pick up on some of the discussion that we sort of started on through particularly the panel discussion um, at the Cultivating the Literacy Landscape Symposium uh, in Auckland. So um, welcome to everybody who's um, joining us for this chit chat this afternoon. I'm just going to take a moment to introduce uh, James Chapman to, to everybody because there might be some new people who are joining us this afternoon, James, who haven't had the privilege of either working with you, listening to you, reading your work or hanging out with you. <laughs> so James Chapman is a Professor Emeritus of Educational Psychology at Massey University. He received his Master's in Education from Victoria University in Wellington and his PhD in Educational Psychology from the University of Alberta, Canada. Uh, he joined Massey University in 1980 and during his 40 plus years at Massey, he served uh, for eight and a half years as head of the Department of Learning and Teaching and 10 years as pro vice chancellor of the College of Education. Uh, Professor James Chapman has published over 150 journal articles, book chapters, and books on learning disabilities, literacy learning difficulties, early literacy development, and motivational factors in academic achievement. In 1999, he was the co-winner of the International Reading Associations. And I'm not sure I'm gonna say this right, James, so I might need you to jump in. Dina? Dina Fiedelson. Thank you. Dina Fiedelson, Award for Excellence in Research. Professor Chapman is a science advisor for the Better Start Literacy Research at University of Canterbury and was on the Ministry of Education Common Practice Model Contributors Group. My goodness, you must feel so proud when I'm sitting here um, reading um, your extensive bio and all that you've done to contribute to um, literacy education, not just here in New Zealand, but globally as well. Thank you, but there's a lot of unfinished work and um, <laughs> having... having been at the same place for 43 years or so and realizing that I'm supposed to be retired but I'm not going to give up until good on you more I is love it. done I yeah. love that resilience and perseverance yeah. let's kick off our chit chat this afternoon by um sort of drilling into what is it that you see are the obstacles that are currently preventing us from embracing, I'm going to say, a structured literacy or really truly evidence-based um, approach to teaching literacy going forward? I, I think that when the term structured literacy comes up for people who don't really know what it's about, who don't know the research, don't know the conceptual or the theoretical underpinnings, that the word structured probably turns some people off. They think it's a, a lockstep recipe that everyone has to follow in a very, very ordered way without any deviation. That, that of course, is a misnomer, but I think that the, the word structured does have some problems. Mm. And I'm, I'm not sure if there's an alternative mm. to that, because unfortunately, it becomes a bit of a distraction. And the distraction is that underlying the concept of a structured literacy approach is what is referred to as the science of reading, which is a collection of scientific studies on reading, not only in the English language world, but in other language systems as well, as well that's, that's been on the go for 30 to 40 years. And structured literacy is a teaching approach that tries to capture the essence of scientific studies on reading, writing, and spelling. So I think the, I see the main impediment as being around the term and the lack of an understanding on the part of people who have not been exposed to the research, haven't had an mm. opportunity to 
um, understand the theoretical models that that underpin this. And even the word theory puts a lot of people off. But as one of my mentors, when I started at Massey University 100 years ago or 40 years ago, <laughs> said, there is nothing more practical than a good theory. Yeah. And he was not a researcher. He was a long established tertiary education teacher, former school teacher, former teacher's college lecturer, and so on. But, but he, he was arguing without needing to argue against me or against other people that a good theory is extremely practical because you can test it and you can throw it away if it doesn't work. And mm. I've been involved in research now for 45, almost 50 years and have thrown away theories that I tested that I thought were accurate at the time, but no longer serve a good purpose because research moves on. Yeah. So yeah. I think so it's, it's go ahead. Yeah. Oh, and I was just going to say, and I think that's another point that we should actually pick up on about the importance of um, people realizing um, that ultimately, like you said, James, that actually structured literacy, really building that understanding that structured literacy is the teaching approach that has been recommended, developed, tried and tested based on the findings of all of that multidisciplinary research titled the science of reading. So it's kind of the outcome, isn't it, in terms of the recommended teaching approach from research. Yeah, it is. And I, I would probably call it more a framework than a specific approach because there are different interpretations of how to implement structured literacy. And I'm not aware of any research so far that says, well, this particular approach is better than that approach. Mm. And I think that that causes a little bit of confusion among teachers who are maybe sitting on the fence and not sure whether yeah. or not they would like to adopt a structured literacy approach because there is there is a lack of uniform agreement on what constitutes structured literacy. Now, mm. for many of us, that doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't matter at all. But for those who are not quite sure, um, uh, and for some who have adopted a structured literacy approach, there's, there's a bit of criticism, oh, well, that's not really structured literacy. And I don't mm. think that's helpful. I think that's actually quite harmful. Mm. Uh, I think that until research demonstrates that a particular framework of structured literacy is clearly superior to alternative frameworks or approaches of structured literacy, we have to go with a with a range of approaches within that broad mm. framework of implementing yeah. scientific research. Mm. And James, I really want to add to that too about, you know, I, I think we might sit in different spaces in terms of where we operate from that place of structured literacy. And when I think about how I've come into structured literacy, it's very much through the International Dyslexia yeah. Association. Yeah. And so what's really important in terms of when I'm talking about fidelity, I'm talking about adherence to the principles and elements that have been laid out by the International Dyslexia Association and understanding that how you implement those principles and elements might be slightly different from structured literacy provider to structured literacy provider. But when you're moving forward and, and or when you're thinking about the integrity of your implementation on a school-wide basis, that's really, really important that your practice is diagnostic, it's systematic, it's cumulative, and it's explicit. Um, and involves all of the elements of teaching um, you know, that have been stipulated um, by, by them at this point in time. Should the evidence shift going forward, you know, and that's where you were sort of going to before uh, when you were talking about um, the theory, should that evidence shift, then we have to be ready to shift with that as well. And, do you know, there are so many times I catch myself out when I... Uh, feel you know when I experience that somebody is challenging the space of working and then I have to be really careful that I'm aware of that bias that I have towards structured literacy because I don't want to end up 
with all due respect to those people who are, you know, completely still sitting in a balanced literacy camp, I don't want to end up that place in 40 years time in the structured literacy camp and people looking at me saying, well, you know what, Carly, you just actually need to bring your practice over to this side. I, I'm really, really well aware of that. And I think we've all got to be aware of that. Yeah, yeah, I think that's good. And I think the, the key point that, that you outlined are some important principles that sit behind or are part of structured literacy and how those uh, principles are implemented will vary from provider to provider. Mm. And I, I don't see a huge problem with that. I think the last thing we want is for everyone in New Zealand doing exactly the same thing at nine o'clock every morning yeah. during, during literacy teaching. That that wouldn't be helpful, but that's the principles that have come from the Interla International Dyslexia Association that are key part. And the mm. implementation and interpretation of the principles will vary, and that's not a big deal. The, it's interesting the balanced literacy people sort of... Uh, get up in arms a little bit about the idea of um, the lack of flexibility and yet they don't realize how rigid uh, mm -hmm. whole language actually was and mm -hmm. has been over the four five six decades that whole language has been in place I mean mm -hmm. the classic example simplistic but the classic example is almost verbatim when a child comes across a word that she or he doesn't know what do you do read on to the end of the sentence come back and think of a word that would fit and then guess a word, look at the picture, get your mouth ready to say the word, look out the window, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, That's pretty it was rigid, actually isn't it? Quite, it was quite rigid. Reading in mm. junior classes in 1985 was a relatively rigid approach. And I think whole language and so-called balanced literacy, which isn't balanced, um, proponents believe that, that there's a lot of flexibility there in terms of what each individual child needs mm. well each individual child doesn't need a lot of individuality because mm. the cognitive processes that are involved in literacy learning and literacy acquisition are fairly similar across children across cultures mm. and across different language systems yeah um, the context mm. will differ and it's the context that we have to attend to more so than the different cognitive processes yeah, um, just going back to an earlier point you made, James, I can actually recall having a conversation with a very senior person from the Ministry of Education um, and the now um, Minister of Education about um, actually professional learning and structured literacy. And we really openly had a conversation around the term structured literacy. And it was tabled, um, not from me, but from them, that the term was polarizing. Yeah. And so when you were saying earlier about, you know, that you think it's the term that is um, uh, getting in the way, and also um, when you do have a chance to watch that um, Sunday Q&A snippet between Jack and Emily, this is discussed there too, and okay. about how um, the languaging um, and a relatively sort of mapped out teaching approach that's very explicit comes from a much more conservative um, perspective. So I just wanted to kind of pick that up again to really, you know, um, encourage people to be open to, it's just a term, but it yes. is a term that holds a lot of representation. Um, don't change the term, but actually I'm going to be really brave, James, and say get over the fact that this term is not about you. This yeah. term is about what is in the here and now best represents the findings from a thousands and thousands of research studies known as the science of reading. So I think that's important that we consider that. Could you provide a deeper explanation for us as to why maintaining reading recovery is considered a less effective um, move for our education system going forward? Well, um, the cynical part of me suggests that the continued funding of reading recovery and the agreement on the part of reading recovery to include phonics and structured literacy is a somewhat desperate approach to continue with reading recovery in one form or another across New Zealand and to continue to receive Ministry of Education funding. And I, I, I think that's a pretty poor way to proceed. So when reading recovery refers to the and plus and approach, it's the old plus the new. Mm. 
And it's the, their, the underlying instructional model of reading recovery is, is really incompatible with the emphasis on the development of word identification skills through an explicit, systematic, structured literacy approach. They're, they're just incompatible. And the sorts of reading materials that are used to support an, ex, an explicit, systematic approach to the development of word level decoding skills are different from the materials that are used in a whole language approach. And the whole language approach is the traditional underlying instructional model of reading recovery. The, the, one of the big problems is that when reading recovery was launched in New Zealand in the early 1980s, cognitive science was already showing that the whole language approach was not beneficial for many learning readers, beginning readers. It was already when did, shown. When, sorry, James, when did you say that was? Early 1980s. Right. So reading recovery research Clay that Clay did was in the late 70s. The research itself was believed to be flawed and was questioned mm. because the research design really couldn't show what she claimed the reading recovery programs showed. However, the then Department of Education rolled it out across New Zealand in the early 1980s, and it was fairly quickly exported to the United States through personal contacts that Clay had in the US. Okay, that's history. That was then. This mm. is now. Mm. The three queuing approach, which is fundamental to how teachers encourage children to identify words that they're reading and that they come across that they don't know, the three queuing approach is totally incompatible with a systematic, explicit focus on the development of word level decoding skills. Mm. And Clay was very, very clear, as whole language advocates have been clear over the, over the decades, that in the three queuing approach, the, the syntax, the meaning, and the um, unfolding nature of the story and the sort of grammatical structure of the sentence that contains the word that the child doesn't know are more important than trying to sound out the word, more important, mm -hmm. important than uh, the phonics that would help a child understand the unknown word that he or she comes across. So it's, it's an incompatible approach. And to say that, well, we can still have the three queuing approach plus phonics and other elements of explicit systematic instruction for word level decoding is, is, is bizarre. It makes no sense to me whatsoever. It's mm. like saying, well, we'll have the best of both worlds. But th the problem is one of those worlds is deeply flawed. Yeah. And so having yeah. the best of both worlds is rubbish. So um, when you're talking to James, you sort of led really nicely into, you know, what you said was the underlying model is incompatible with what's been recommended through the implementation of a structured literacy approach. Yes. And when you're talking about the three queuing system, you know, I think it's really important for people to understand because some teachers won't know they're using the three queuing system. But if yeah. they're administering running records in their classrooms, they are using the three queuing system, right? Correct. Because they are marking off M, S, or V wherever that um, wherever yeah. that error lies. So um, to add to what you were saying, I, I think that as you were talking, I was thinking, yeah, you know, and further to what you're saying is that we now do know how the brain learns to read. Yeah. And we know that we have to teach in a way that consciously activates um, certain parts of the reading brain to ensure that process of orthographic mapping actually occurs. Which approach are we most likely to um, activate the reading brain and ensure orthographic mapping occurs, which is the... Um, process of storing words to long-term memory so that it appears they are reading them by sight. Um, that's a structured literacy approach. It's certainly not um, a balanced literacy or whole language approach. And to think, because we talk a lot, don't we, about, you know, reading recovery often teaches to the strategies of our struggling readers as opposed to intervening with those students. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. Um, the the incompatibility um, 
is absolutely stark. And I'm, I'm really, really surprised, except for my opening cynical statement about the need to continue with funding for reading recovery. I'm surprised that people who should know better are trying to convince the ministry and to convince the general public and parents and so forth, teachers, that a mix of the old and a mix with the new is mm. actually the, the ideal best of both worlds. But that is even more balanced but unbalanced than the so-called yeah. balanced whole language approach. Mm. I mean, it, it is awfully unbalanced. Yeah. And we already have research in New Zealand, but also in many other countries at tier two and tier three intervention for struggling readers using a more structured literacy approach that works, particularly for those children who initially struggle with reading acquisition, with learning mm. to read, and especially children in low decile, high deprivation schooling settings through no fault of their own, have, a, have an even additional struggle with learning to read. Mm. And so I, I just can't, for the life of me, understand why this would be an and and other than what I've already said a couple of times, the cynicism associated with trying to maintain funding. But mm. there's, there's too much baggage with reading recovery. There's decades of failure of reading recovery to acknowledge the shortcomings. Now, I would believe reading recovery and and if reading recovery said, okay, we thought we were doing the right thing. We've got it wrong. We now realize because the Ministry of Education has informed us that a systematic, structured, explicit approach to teaching for children who are struggling with learning to read is a better way to go than what we previously did. I would like them to be honest and say, mm. we got it wrong. Mm. We acknowledge that the three queuing approach has all sorts of flaws that research has now shown for close to four decades. We acknowledge that. We acknowledge that there are other problems with how we've gone about implementing reading recovery. And if they truly accept the need for explicit, structured, systematic approach to literacy instruction for struggling readers, then they should say that we got it wrong. We now want to get it right because we've got the infrastructure. We've got money from the Ministry of Education and we will go with the what mm. science of reading says. Until totally. that happens, which I don't think it will happen, but until that happens, then I think their and and approach is absolutely suspect. Mm -hmm. When uh, we had the privilege of spending some time with um, Professor Pamela Snow across the course of the Cultivating the Literacy Landscape Symposium, one of the things that she said to me often was, you know, Carla, we, we would talk about these things in different, when we were sort of traveling at different times. She said, well, you know, one of the, the, the reality is this. It's like, you know, when you're sitting on the plane and they do the emergency announcement, and this has actually happened to me once where they say, you know, this aircraft's going to make an emergency landing, blah, blah, blah. She said, the reality is this, you get to take nothing with you. And actually, what we need to realize as a profession, as hard as it sounds, because all too often we have this saying of, oh, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. Actually, as she said to me about five times on her trip to New Zealand, this is the time where the plane is otherwise going to crash and you don't get to take anything with you, actually. You are going it alone um, into this new practice. You're not taking any of those old practices or ways of teaching um, with you. And I know, James, and I appreciate that that's hard for people to hear and they will push back on me saying that. Well, but it's the truth. Carla, uh, according to the latest ministry annual monitoring survey of reading recovery the number of schools delivering reading recovery in New Zealand is now 41 percent an all-time low from a high of in the 80 percentage range so a lot of schools are clearly voting with their feet and saying mm. we know the program isn't meeting our needs we will forego the funding from the ministry of education and we will do our own thing and a lot of our own thing is moving to a more structured literacy approach mm. so 41 percent of schools i mean that's relatively small now yeah and so and and i mean we're aware of quite a large number of schools that are taking the money and teaching structured literacy you know yeah and yeah, I struggle with that from a place of kind of um, sense of moral purpose because you're actually yep. signaling that you want to do that ultimately, you know, and we're yep. trying to influence a shift and advocate for that shift. But but at the same time, I get it. I get that 
you know, one, these teachers have the knowledge, in many cases, they have the tools, and three, that funding pocket really helps them to yeah. intervene in an evidence-based way. I totally get that. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, hard. Right. I mean, the really other hard. thing is that uh, half of the schools that have pulled out of reading recovery, if, if say, we had 80%, it was higher than that during its peak, and we're now down to 41%. So roughly 40% of schools, mm. half the schools that used to deliver reading recovery have found something else. So the idea, oh, what do we replace it with? Oh, what, who, will these kids miss out? No, they won't miss out. Mm. And in fact, many kids will be salvaged from being further damaged by a program yeah. that is flawed mm. and that does not meet the needs of many kids who continue to experience fa failure either during the program or a few years after the program. So uh, canning, I, I think um, I think we should go cold turkey on this. I think Pamela Snow is absolutely right. Mm. Don't take it with you. It's time to move on. Yeah. The program is way, way, way past its use by date. And Ministry of Education figures every year demonstrate that. No one's mm. paying attention. Yeah. James, let's shift our focus now to be thinking about the importance of um, uh, pre-service teach education and thinking about universities what are the changes or sort of initiatives that you think are needed to, to really compel universities to adopt um, structured literacy I'm going to say as a mandatory component of um, their teacher education programs yeah I, I think Carla that that's that's an extremely difficult one. Having been head of a university college of education for 10 years, um, I can see that that sort of change in mandating would be, would be a challenge, but not impossible. Um, I think first up, the Ministry of Education should play a role as it has in the past by providing new instructional guidebooks that are based on mm. contemporary research to the colleges of education. They've done that. The current one is, is uh, effective literacy practices, or I call them defective literacy practices, <laughs> years one to four. Now, the ministry says, oh, we don't tell teachers how to teach. Well, implicitly they do. And those instructional books have been powerful right from the first one, reading in junior classes, mm. to the current one, effective literacy practices. So the first thing that the ministry, that could be done here to change the way that teachers are taught in our uh, education colleges would be to change the instructional guidelines. Effective literacy practices was out of date the day that it was published. It was clearly out of date. Now it's long, long out of date now. It needs to be updated. And I think the ministry should do that. I think, um, I, think a, I think the colleges of education some will resist being told how to teach initial teacher education in any subject, let alone uh, literacy. And a little bit of context here. Um, I was involved in the merger negotiations between the Faculty of Education at Massey University, of which I was a member, and the Palmerston North College of Education. And along with the other mergers that occurred in other uh, main centres, we believed that having research informed initial teacher education would be a good thing. Having lecturers and teachers colleges understand more about the research that underpins pedagogy across all subject areas would be a good thing. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think what a number of us, I'll speak for myself, underestimated is the resistance against that. It wasn't explicit, well, there was some explicit resistance, but it was more implicit resistance on the part of those lecturers who came into the university from the former standalone colleges or teachers' colleges. And it was really a, a, a debate or an argument between a research-based profession versus a more trades-based approach, hands-on approach to teacher education. Both are required, hands-on mm. and research a research base. But if you don't have the, the foundations, if teachers, beginning teachers, don't have the foundations of understanding education, society, child development, pedagogical approaches, pedagogical theory, and what research says, eventually they will run out of fuel. 
totally it goes so far and won't be able yeah. to go any further and a good question is well what do you do when what you're doing doesn't work how do you know what to do next mm. and many teachers will fall back on what they've been doing even though they know it might not be working because they haven't been trained to do anything differently mm. now I've, I've said quite openly in public i think that the purpose of the of the mergers between the teachers' colleges and the university, the fundamental purpose that I've just outlined has generally not been successful. For me, that was an intense disappointment as I saw it unfold uh, before my own eyes uh, here at Massey University. Um, we never really succeeded in getting those sort of theoretical research foundations into initial teacher education. I tried it with my colleagues in terms of developing a new four-year initial teacher education bachelor's degree, which had substantially more literacy teaching based on research. That was partially successful, but in the end, the program couldn't survive because it was too expensive to run. Mm. The funding for a four-year program was, was not adequate. And there were various uh, attempts to subvert that particular approach. Now, okay, what do we do? That was then, this is now. What, what do we need to do? Um, in addition to the Ministry of Education providing updated guidance for beginning teachers distributed to colleges of education, now in the universities and across all schools. In addition to that, I think a starting point would be for the Teaching Council and the Ministry of Education to invite the various deans or pro vice chancellors of education into a day long meeting, or at least one day, maybe two days, to discuss the shortcomings of pedagogy, pedagogical approaches that are now in initial teacher education. Now, that's easier said than done because teachers' colleges in the universities are very strongly wedded to a social constructivist mm -hmm. approach to teaching. And, and that is a more uh, learning by doing, learning mm. by discovery approach. And many teachers who are using that might not know that this is a social constructivist approach, that students will construct their own learning with minimal guidance from the teacher. The role of the teacher is not to teach, but to provide guidance for learners. And that includes literacy, mathematics, and a whole range of areas. So if we focus on literacy, outside of the broader context, which is dominated by this constructivist approach to teaching in our colleges of education, there's, there's going to be all sorts of problems. Mm. I don't see that constructivist zeitgeist moving anytime soon. And I'm intensely disappointed that our colleges of education now in the universities are going on ideology and not on research and th theoretical approaches and research approaches. We have some very, very good theoretical models in literacy that are seldom taught in the colleges of education, as far as I know. If we take the simple view of reading, which has been around since the mid-1980s, been the subject of countless numbers of empirical research studies, now uh, revised into the cognitive foundations of mm. learning to read to incorporate new research, that would be a good underlying theoretical principle that's based on research, that's been supported by research for all beginning teachers to adhere to as they adopt a more structured, explicit approach to literacy instruction. Getting College of Education lecturers in some of our universities, not all, but in some of them, to utilize a model like that, if not that specific model, getting them to do that is going to be a big challenge. But I would mm. like to see the deans of education have a meeting with the teaching council and with the Ministry of Education to try and work this out. The teaching council itself needs to get away from its fairly woolly, fluffy guidelines for what uh, beginning teachers need to have in order to be registered mm. and to be much more explicit like other professions, like law, like medicine, architecture, engineering, accounting which generally have more, uh, more explicit requirements for what counts to be registered mm. or certificated in those yeah. other professions. Teaching doesn't, and it should. 
It totally should. I've, I've taken away so many little bits from what you've said, James. And but ultimately, I wrote down there actually needs to be like a cultural shift within these organizations. There needs to be a shift. And, you know, when you talk about that social constructivist model, uh, there needs to be this real shift away from that fundamentally, because that you're talking about the science of teaching and learning when you're talking about that social constructivist model. And I think, how on earth can we just breed teachers out into this workforce across the country and not prepare them? We just, um, it, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that isn't a great one. Yeah, there is another change mechanism. I mean, I think you're right, Carla, that if we continue to do this, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. But I see another change mechanism occurring in a more grassroots sense. I think as, as students go out for teaching practice and are mentored by mm -hmm. ex supposedly experienced teachers, although mm. that's not always the case, as more schools adopt a structured literacy explicit approach to literacy instruction, they should and hopefully will demand more of the students who come out of the colleges yes. of education for their teaching experience. Now, there's a two-edged sword there because uh, even today in the year 2023, there are schools that some um, student teachers go out for teaching practice where the teachers will say, now, look, forget all that theoretical stuff in the ivory <laughs> tower. This is how we do it in our school. Just, just do what we mm. do here. Mm. Now, that can be and has been a recipe for the status quo, the preservation of the status quo. But, mm. the, but what it speaks to is more a breakdown of what should be a better relationship between university, education, colleges, yeah. and normal schools mm. that have a big responsibility for being partners in initial teacher education, and the other schools where mm. students go for their teaching practice. And um, again, having seen it up close and personal, I think part of the breakdown in that relationship is due to, dare I say, the arrogance on the part of some university lecturers and the somewhat condescending and dismissive approaches that they take to teachers, both in normal schools as well as in, in mm. other schools that take students on their teaching practice or teaching section. Yeah, but James, I find that so ironic when, you know, um, you were talking about the need for lecturers to understand the research, you know, bottom line, it's got to be a theory to practice model. It's got to be a theory to practice model. When I think about the shift and, you know, many, many of the teachers that we've worked with, the shift fundamentally stems from them learning about the why, them learning about the theories that you were referring to, them learning about the you know, basics around how the brain learns to read, those things are pivotal to then secure yeah. the what and the how. Because if we're out there and we're working with students and we see them having difficulty, it's that theoretical knowledge um, and those frameworks that help us really pinpoint the steps to move those students forward and yeah I just think it's it, I'm somewhat flawed to be honest to hear about that um you know when you when you use that analogy of a trades trades based approach I just think come on we've got to raise the bar and 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 I also was writing notes and I put a big square around the ministry of education because I believe they too if they get the curriculum somewhat right, if they get the common practice model somewhat right, if they, as you said, create um, these instructional textbooks that actually stipulate, you know, we've got all of these um, ports of call for how we in New Zealand teach and how we teach um, based on the findings of the science of reading, that's got to go a long way towards influencing um, uh, other than the cultural elements that you spoke about, but that, that is hopefully going to go a long way towards um, changing maybe um, aspects of teacher training in New Zealand. Well, I think that's absolutely right. And the other component is the willingness on the part of many teachers to go ahead with their own upskilling. Mm -hmm. And we, when we, when we realised that changes to initial teacher education were very limited, 
um, we decided, well, I think our, our best bet for creating change is in our postgraduate courses, our master's and postgraduate diploma courses, where we have um, generally more experienced teachers, mid-senior career teachers coming in, wanting to take a course. If they came to Massey, they knew what they were going to get. They weren't going to get whole language and they mm. weren't going to get balanced literacy. They were going to get a pretty solid research to base approach based to literacy. So um, they knew what they wanted. They knew that what they were doing wasn't working and there had to be a better way. And the, the change that occurred from um, scores, probably hundreds of, yeah, um, well, yeah, hundreds and hundreds mm -hmm. of teachers coming into our postgraduate courses for a master's or a postgraduate diploma. That's where the change occurred. Mm -hmm. Mm. And some of them are now leaders across New Zealand in their own particular spheres who've come through courses like that at Massey or at other universities mm. where all the lights go on. They say, ah, yeah. oh, now I understand it. I understand, like you said, the theoretical framework mm -hmm. that helps, helps, that will help me as a, become a better teacher. And I understand the research that empirically demonstrates the benefits of the approach that you're, that you're presenting to us from research mm. we're not trying to brainwash people totally. and when we have reading recovery teachers come in some of them somewhat reluctantly realizing mm. they should get a postgraduate qualification and there's always good questions at the beginning of the year and towards the end of the year oh now I understand I wish mm. I knew that before or some will say they never taught me this in teachers college oh uh, yeah I, I wish I'd known yeah. that um, I but, hear that so often but I think that I, I think We've got to learn from this, right? And one of the big things that we learn from this, I'm going to say, is that postgrad is too late. It's got to be just like with our kids in their tier one mainstream yep. instruction. It's yep. got to be in that initial pre-service teacher training because too, so many people don't go on to do postgrad study. Absolutely. And and why should they? You know, you wouldn't go and learn to be an, you wouldn't do your um, apprenticeship to become an electrician and then be in that workforce for three, four years and then go and um, finally do your actual training that you needed to do. You know, they yeah. are trained to deliver straight away. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I absolutely agree. That's that is true. It's too late. And I think pressure to change will come from the ministry or could come from the ministry, should come from the teaching council. Yeah. Will come from grassroots support, mm. will come from lifting literacy out and other advocacy groups, will come from parents who are fed up that their kids can't read and they've been in school for two or three years. Mm. Will come from private providers like you and others who are working in schools across the country those sort of grassroots um, organic changes mm. will also make a huge contribution because then schools will be armed with questions to say, well, when, when we get someone coming for teaching mm. practice from the university, why are, we, why are they doing this? Why are they doing that? Mm. Um, get with the program, guys. Come on, yeah. this is out of yeah. date. Totally. So, James, if we think back to the things that we've discussed this afternoon in this chat chat, we started... Um, talking about, you know, what did you see were really those main obstacles preventing us from embracing structured literacy? And you really honed in on the term structured. Um, and we and we um, chatted about that. And, and I'm going to say me sort of saying that let, we've got to get over that terminology. Um, but we've at the same time got to be always going forward, open to what new research presents to us. There's no doubt about about that um, and be aware of any confirmation biases we're forming towards one particular area so we've really got to we've got to learn from the history right we've got to learn from the ingrained way of how it's been we talked about um reading recovery and you know the why maintaining the reading recovery and what the challenge is there and you really really honed in on the reality that um, the underlying model, and I'm going to say the underlying principles, the underlying theory of reading recovery is incompatible with the now findings of the science of reading. And a part of those findings are actually neuroscience fMRI scans of how the brain learns to read. And, you know, I know one particular neuroscientist, James Guinevere Eden, has actually researched um, she has researched 
um, in her field of neuroscience, looking at students who have been intervened with a balanced literacy approach and those intervened with a structured literacy approach. And she has clearly shown the differences um, through um, fMRI scans, the difference and what happens to the to um, to the actual brain when we teach in a structured literacy approach. Um, and we talked about that um, little saying of Professor Pamela Snows of, you know, if there ever was a time when um, the plane is going to go down and we're going to have to leave all our belongings, whether we like it or not, this is one of those times. We cannot be thinking about adopting an and and approach. It just will not. It will not represent or um, uh, be a, we, it will not um, portray the findings of the science of reading um, if we were to do that. And then in terms of teacher um, training institutions, change is a challenge or change is the challenge uh, were your words. Um, you talked about some kind of key drivers, the teaching council, the Ministry of Education, but I think you've actually really pinpointed some very specific things like um, the need for there to be an updated textbook um, and for, I'm going to say, um, those teacher training institutions themselves, as much as, yes, we will continue to, to try to um, do that work at grassroots level, it is time for them to have a good look inward and actually think about the model of teaching and learning that goes on in that social constructivist model um, and for us to be open to having conversations. At the New Zealand Principals Conference last week, I had a fantastic conversation um, with Naomi, who's the Associate Dean from um, Otago University. And we had a really good conversation um, about this space. And I look forward to connecting with her in the future. So, you know, I think we've just all got to be open to having those conversations with people in those different places. But ultimately, your idea of the Ministry of Education and the Teaching Council bringing those people together and sitting them around a table and actually discussing this is, is going to be a really good next step forward. Well, I hope so. And I guess it, it, will, take, it will take the ministry and leadership within the ministry and, dare I say, potentially political leadership as well. And I, mm. and I don't necessarily mean political party leadership, but politicians have been absent from this space, possibly for good reason. Mm. But um, we have had political leadership in the past in certain areas, and I think I think the space is ready for some strong political leadership as well. Mm. Not, when, not dictatorial leadership, but exactly. Leadership. Yeah, and when you have a chance to listen to that Q and A segment between Jack and Emily, um, there is I can't remember the exact quote from Emily, but um, you know I, th I think Jack asks a question around you know mandating practice or something like this, and. Emily comes back and really um, clearly um, answers that at the end of the day, the job of the government is to lead the way forward. The job of the government is to determine where investment sits. The job of the government is to ensure policy direction is evidence-based. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, whatever political party it is, and yes, it would, wouldn't it be great to have... Um, to have political parties in agreement around this. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, what we really need is, is for the government to come out and say, this is how it's going to be. This is the best way to teach our children going forward. This is how we're going to support um, teacher training institutions um, and really um, pave the way forward and lead with that. Yeah. And it can be done. It's been done in England and Wales, probably possibly Scotland, I'm not sure. It's been done in some states in Australia. And I think also there's been stronger federal leadership in Australia. And um, we could we can do that here as well. Mm. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. Really always enjoy catching up with you, um, James, and talking about what I'm going to say is the heart of the matter. <laughs> that's good no thanks uh thanks for the opportunity to comment carla and thank you for the work that you're doing um as a as a contributor to change in new zealand as a change agent i think that's good and i hope that those who are watching this uh streaming um have a good think about what's been said um if they disagree with some things that's fine but think yeah. about it further interrogate mm. 
interrogate any of us, interrogate Absolutely. the research. Yeah. And I think when we do disagree, James, it's important that we actually look in with at that point of disagreement, right? And we say, why is it? What is it about this thing that's really stuck with me yeah. that, um, that I'm feeling uncomfortable about and what might I need to consider here? That's important for all of us as we move forward in this space. Absolutely. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us uh, this afternoon. Our next chit chat will be um, coming up in a couple of months. And do keep an eye out for some really exciting things that we've got planned for Dyslexia Awareness Month. Thanks, Carla. Thanks, James.